Now that we have understood the uh, uh, yeah, situation about the canonical commutation relations in the case of one or a finite number of degrees, uh, we want to go over to the infinite dimensional situation, uh, an infinite number of degrees. Uh, first one might think the situation should be the same, so there should be one irreducible representation, the analog of the Schrödinger representation, and everything else is equivalent to this. Uh, but this is totally wrong. Uh, the situation is, is very different. And I mean, in the beginning of quantum mechanics and when quantum field theory came around, uh, or on the mathematical side, it really took some time to realize that the situation there is, is very different. Huh? And so what we want to do is, so in this lecture, we want just to see what is, m what is the infinite dimensional or the infinite, yeah, for an infinite number of degrees, the analog of the Schrodinger representation. Uh, and then in the next lecture, we want to see that actually there are much more representations which, which are not equivalent. Uh, but, but now I'm just trying to give at least one representation, which is the analog of the Schrodinger situation in, the, in this case. And uh, to realize this, we will go to do this on a, on a Fox space, a symmetric Fox space. And in this context, we will also talk about second quantization and, of course, creation and annihilation operators. Um, so it's a symmetric Fox space and let's say second quantization is also a second quantization. It's also a topic showing up there. Good, so what is the idea? So what we want to do is we want to realize the CCR, oh, so the CCR, was given if I have one degree of freedom. Uh, it was given by this relation. I have an operator P and Q, should be self-adjoint and so on. Uh, and then, if we of course, we can go on to look on copies of this. Uh, not just having one P and Q, but having uh, yeah, some number of them. And might be a finite number or what we are interested now, an in infinite number. Huh? So what we want to consider is PI and QJ, uh, so we have the same relation if I is equal to J and otherwise things commute. And of course, because we now also have different P's and different Q's, we also have to, spec to specify the relation between them, but that should just be a commutation relation. So the PI and the PJ should always commute and the QI and the uh, QJ should always commute. And in the last lecture, we already saw how we can realize this if we have here a finite number of degrees. We just take what we did for one number of degree, one P and Q, uh, namely taking L2 of R, and then P is a differentiation operator and Q is a multiplication operator, and we do this just for a finite number. Uh, so we take L2 of R to the N, and then we have N multiplication operators, which are the Qs, and we have N differentiation operators, which are the Ps. Yeah, and now, of course, we would like to go to the infinite situation where n is equal to infinity, but of course then we have a problem because it's not so clear. I mean, then we should realize this on L, L2 to the R to the infinity, and there we are somehow lost, uh, in particular because uh, we consider functions with respect to integration, so we need a Lebesgue measure, uh, and now we would need uh, functions in infinitely many variables, and we would like to integrate them with, with respect to a Lebesgue measure. Uh, and this is something which, which is not really there in infinite dimensions. Uh, so we cannot do it directly in this way, but what we can do instead is that we are not taking the P and the Q as our primary object, but we take this uh, A and A star, this creation and annihilation operator. Huh? So we defined an operator uh, which was P plus Q, Q and P minus uh, Q, or the other way around, and we called them A, and then this relation here, PQ equal to minus I1, translated into A, A star is equal to 1. And of course, we can also uh, go over to the situation with a finite number of degrees. We already did this. I mean, in the L2 of R case from last time, we did this. So we have here AI and AJ, and then we should have here delta IJ. And of course, the, the different A's and the different uh, AJ stars should commute. Huh? And of course, this is the adjoint, the AJ star is the adjoint of, of, the, of the AJ. Uh, and in this case, um, 
we will see that actually, yeah, in this formulation, we can generalize this uh, to an infinite number of degrees. Uh, and this is also somehow uh, maybe a good approach, because if you remember, uh, in terms of this representation, it was somehow easy, or yeah, there was the, the vacuum had a very specific uh, property with respect to this, namely the A is considered as an annihilation operator, and A acting on a vacuum uh, annihilates everything, and on the other hand, if you are acting with the A star, on the vacuum, we can create our Hilbert space. Uh, that was the idea which I gave in the beginning uh, when we talked about why should there be, why should the, the, the Schrodinger representation be unique? It should be unique because we should always be able to find a vacuum, and then from this vacuum we can uh, create everything. Uh, and this, this creation is not usually, I mean, it's not so obvious in terms of P and Q, but it's much more obvious in, in, te in terms of A. And so what we are going to do is uh, to try to realize those operators on a space where we have a vacuum, and from this we can create the whole space by applying all the, all the A stars. Okay, and this will, will be then our, our Fox space. Yeah. Good, but so what? I mean, we need a few things for doing this, so maybe let me start with this remark, what we really need to understand uh, for, for doing this program. Yeah. So some remarks. So we should have a, a Hilbert space. Uh, so this will be the Fox space in the end. Uh, so our Hilbert space should in particular uh, have a vacuum. So it should contain a vacuum. And the fact that it's irreducible, the representation should mean there's essentially one vacuum. Huh? Uh, so, uh, so it should contain a spe spe specific vector, which we call vacuum, and denote by omega. Um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, we should also have uh, a basic Hilbert space, which corresponds to the infinite degrees which we have. Huh? So we should have what one calls one particle elements. Maybe I denote them by F. So lying in some Hilbert space. Uh, so this Hilbert space is not the, the Hilbert space, the Fox space, which contains everything, but it's, it's just a part of it, the one particle space. Um, and yeah, this corresponds either to particle or maybe it, it's, it's the field modes if, if, we have a, if we have a field. Yeah, okay, but then we should also be able so we should be able to create from omega, from the vacuum, uh, if I apply my creation operator once, I'm getting elements in this Hilbert space, but then I can apply them more often, which has the yeah, intuitive meaning that I'm creating more particles. Uh, so we should also have n particle elements. Uh, which essentially I should get if I apply my creation operators n times to the vacuum, then I should get n particle elements. And those will be uh, given in terms of taking a tensor product of the one particle element. So F1 tensor Fn. Okay, and those are elements in the n fold tensor product of this guy with itself. So we should understand a little bit tensor product of Hilbert spaces. But then, in addition, of course, we are not fixing the n because we can apply the gradient operator once, we can apply it twice or three times, so we should have uh, one particle vectors, two particle vectors, three particle vectors, but of course we can also take arbitrary linear combinations between them, so we should also have uh, different combinations of all, or combinations of all elements of this form for different ends. Huh? Of course we have linear combinations of those guys for the same n, but then we can also take linear combinations where we also vary the n. So we also want or need combinations of different numbers of particles. And these guys will be somehow in a, in a sum, a direct sum of elements from here. Huh? So what, what we need in the end, maybe the most general things are lying 
in a direct sum over n over the tensor powers of n. Yeah, okay, and this guy taking direct sum of tensor powers of n, that's what one calls the Fox space, or maybe more precisely the full Fox space over H. Uh, so this guy here, this would be the full Fox space over H. Yeah, okay, but that's not really what we want because uh, you should see that if I have migration operators, so in particular I require that let's say AI star and AJ star this commutes if, uh, no, this, this always commutes because AI star of course commutes with AI star, but the question is what happens with I one, A1 star and A2 star and they should also all commute huh, because we want the same for the P's. Um, and this means that if I act with migration operators, if I first create a particle one and then a particle two, this should be the same as doing it the other way around. Oh, okay, so this means what I want to consider are actually not all elements in those tensor powers, but only symmetric ones. Oh, and this, in physical terms, means this, I, I'm looking on particles, uh, which, which are called bosons. Oh, that, that's the typical, uh, that's the maybe the, the classical kind of particles where different uh, guys commute. Oh, there are also fermions, which we are not looking at now, but we are looking on, on yeah, bosons. Uh, and then, so this means we are not looking on a full Fox space, but only on, on a version of it, which is the bosonic or symmetric Fox space, which means uh, our our elements in the tensors, they should, uh, they should uh, commute. Huh? So, yeah, since we have that AI star, AJ star is the same as AJ star, AI star, huh? that's part of our canonical commutation relations. Uh, so we have actually to consider, uh, yeah, the so-called bosonic Fox space. Uh, where we want that actually we have the symmetry that, for example, F tensor G should be identified with G tensor F. Uh, in the tensor product, a priori F tensor G is a different element than G tensor F, uh, but so here in this guy they would be different, but we want to have it in, a, in another version, a symmetrized uh, Fox space or the bosonic Fox space. So because we want this, So we have to consider not the full Fox space, but uh, to consider the, let's say, the symmetric Fox space or the bosonic Fox space, or yeah, that's just another name huh? after Bo Bose. Huh? I mean, fermionic and bosonic are called after Bose and, and, and Fermi, uh, and of course, symmetric and antisymmetric are called according to the symmetry uh, relations which, uh, which I want to have there. Good. Okay, so that's uh, just the motivation how our Hilbert space should look like or what the structure of this should be and uh, how we should describe it in, in, in mathematical terms uh, where we can define or have a nice a representation for our creation and annihilation operators. Uh, okay, but you see, so what we need to understand maybe a little bit, uh, or maybe just to recall a little bit, I need a tensor product of Hilbert spaces, uh, and I also need a, a direct sum where I'm running over all natural numbers. Uh, and that's maybe uh, the thing which I define first and talk a little bit about those uh, basic mathematical uh, quantities.